This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Hopes are rising that the Suez Canal in Egypt may soon be reopened after an enormous container ship blocked the canal and now has partially refloated, uh, been refloated earlier today. The 200,000-ton ship, the Ever Given, got stuck six days ago, blocking one of the world's most important trade routes. The waterway, which opened in 1868, connects the Mediterranean with the Indian Ocean. More than 450 other container ships are waiting to enter the canal, which is used for about 12 percent of all global trade. Some ships have opted to sail around the Horn of Africa, instead of waiting for the Suez Canal to reopen. The impact of the canal shutdown is already being felt. Syria has begun to ration fuel after a Syria-bound ship carrying oil was prevented from entering the canal. The crisis has also raised new questions about global trade practices, including the reliance on massive cargo ships. The Ever Given is almost as long as the Empire State Building is high. The ship's cargo would extend for 75 miles if placed in a straight line. We go now to London, where we're joined by Lala Khalili, professor of international politics at the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary University of London. She's the author of several books, including most recently Sinews of War and Trade, Shipping and Capitalism in the Arabian Peninsula. Halili's new piece for The Washington Post is headlined, Big Ships Were Created to Avoid Relying on the Suez Canal. Ironically, a big ship is now blocking it. Hello, Professor. It's great to have you with us. Can you start off by just describing what has happened in the Suez over this past week? Um, hi, Amy. I'm very happy to be with you today. So the ship um, was obviously in a convoy heading north from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean, and it was carrying goods. It had um, its uh, point of origin was the port of Ningbo in China, and it had made a couple of stops in Malaysia on the way to Europe. Its destination is Rotterdam. As it got into the ship, there were massive winds blowing across the canal. There are transversal winds blowing across the canal. And um, of course, captains are quite experienced in trying to steer the ships. And one of the ways that they do this is by steering into the wind. I think in this instance, um, perhaps it didn't quite work out. And from what it seems like, that massive gust of wind resulted in the ship spinning a little bit, and that resulted in turn in uh, hydrodynamic problems down below the ship. So the ship ended up getting um, diagonally wedged. Uh, its its uh, prow got wedged in the east uh, uh, side of the canal, and its um, uh, aft, or its stern, um, was on the west side of the canal. And so it essentially cut off all movement um, across the canal uh, on Tuesday. And since then, there's been a lot of effort to try and refloat it. Um, and part of the problem has been that it has lodged on the side of the canal. Part of the problem is that the canal is kind of a, it's got a, um, it, its edges are not quite as deep as its center is. And so it's uh, being wedged at the front and the back in the side of the canal means that it needs to have uh, dredgers dig the sand and the mud around it in order to release it, and then it has to be refloated down the center of the canal, pushed forward or towed forward to one of the lakes that, is in, that are in the center of the canal in order for the convoys to resume uh, their movement across the Suez Canal. Um, the enormity of this ship, the Empire State Building on its side, if you can yeah. talk about how ships got this large, and also in the context of where it is right now, explain the significance and history of the Suez Canal and its uh, importance in global trade. So the Suez Canal, as uh, your uh, listeners probably know, uh, was actually dug by the French and the British in order to consolidate their imperial hold on Asian Africa. So that was um, intended to facilitate the connection between Mediterranean and Asian Africa. And when it was nationalized in 1956 by um, then uh, Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser, uh, when uh, the, the British, the French and the Israelis attacked um, the canal, and the canal was shut down because there was war debris and ships in there. 
So that is really interesting and ironic because, of course, that moment is the moment at which a lot of shipping companies, this was the height of global trade. There was lots of oil flowing from the Middle East to Europe because, the, of course, this is the 1950s after the Second World War. Industries, again, taking uh, off in Europe. And so um, the canal was really crucial to these moments. And when it was shut down by that attack, um, the shipping companies started looking at ways to make the rounding of the Cape of Good Hope, the southern tip of Africa, make it more economically viable. And so the economies of scale dictated the creation of these mega ships. And as years have gone by, the ships have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger because this, of course, is much more profitable for shipping companies. Uh, so it's kind of ironic that these very large mega ships that have been created have caused also the closure of the canal. Now, in terms of what the canal does, the canal is uh, connects, of course, Asia and uh, Europe. Uh, it's the shortest route between Asia and Europe. And part of the reason that it is so significant is because, as you mentioned earlier, 12% of global trade um, passes through it. But it's one of the three most important routes, the other two being transatlantic and transpacific routes for the movement of goods. Of course, as also your listeners know, China and East Asia, East and Southeast Asia, are now the factories of the world. And so a lot of manufactured good is produced there. And, of course, there is the oil that flows not only northward, not only from the Middle East and go the Gulf, but also, for example, Azeri oil or Kazakh oil that come from uh, the Black Sea and Libyan oil that comes from the Mediterranean flows south to go to Asia. So it's still quite a significant artery of global trade. Can you talk about the economic toll overall of what this means and what you see happening next, a kind of reckoning taking place, or will there be? So I, I hope that there will be a reckoning. Usually such uh, massive kind of issues that, um, that end up uh, affecting global trade tend to have some after echoes. Um, although there have been other instances of ships um, having gotten stuck in the canal and being released, but none have taken as long as this one has. Now, the reason that this is quite significant, obviously the very first um, category of uh, sort of people who are hurt by this are, is the Egyptian government that collects something like 700 thousand dollars per ship's passage in the canal. So if you've got 400 ships waiting to, to pass, it's that much of the fees that the Egyptian uh, government is not collecting uh, from the Suez Canal. There are, of course, other um, uh, victims of this, if you will. And I think that those are those have often been forgotten. So, uh, And those are the seafarers that are sitting on these ships. I think it's really important to acknowledge, and very few people have done, that seafarers have had some of the hardest um, months of work in the last uh, year or so, because with the closure of ports and airports, they have been stuck on board ships, sometimes for months after their contracts have ended, um, sometimes without being paid wages. And so the fact that now, again, there are going to be delays, that, 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 that they could potentially not be able to fly home at the time that they have, I think that it's really important to acknowledge that they are, um, uh, they, they tend to, this has worked to their detriment in a great and major way. And of course, there are others, uh, what we hear about, for example, just-in-time production of automobiles in Europe has been one of the um, categories of manufacturing that has been hurt by this. And of course, uh, clean gasoline that comes northward through the canal, um, has there, there are going to be delays in the delivery of those. And so there are, there are a number of very specific categories of um, sort of manufacturing that have been affected. One final thing is that, and we don't know the exact um, whether or not this is the case, but we also know that India is right now one of the world's biggest farmers pharmaceutical manufacturing locations. And we know that um, India is where a, a, a great uh, percentage of the world's various vaccines, um, COVID vaccines, are being manufactured. So it is also possible that some of the ships that are awaiting passage through the canal, there might be some that are also carrying vaccines and are awaiting uh, passage. So there are, we, we'll, the, the picture is going to be a lot more clear after the flow has started and we have a better sense of what cargo is being carried on the ships that have been delayed or ships that have had to be rerouted around the Cape of Good Hope. But at the moment, those are all the possible areas where there could be a delay, um, and, and there are people that have been hurt by that process. I want to go to Osama Rabi, chairman of the Suez Canal Authority, speaking at a news conference Saturday. Uh, so, the first 
Regarding the case of the accident, strong winds and sandstorm were not the main cause, and there might be technical failures and mechanical problems of the vessel or other human factors, but these specific reasons has not been identified yet. Weather is only part of the complicated causes of the accident. Can you respond to what he is saying, and then also talk about who owns this ship? Um, what flag is flown on this ship? So I think the question of flags and ownership is really quite important because it really affects the who is going to be held responsible for this. So the ship is actually owned by a Japanese company. It is operated by a Taiwan-based um, shipping company called Evergreen, which is one of the world's biggest shipping um, sh uh, freight carriers. But the ship itself um, is, uh, and, and of course, it has agents that are based in the Gulf, and it has uh, ship management staff that are German. So it's a kind of an international, if you will. It's, it's an international of different kinds of corporations. But what is quite significant is that the ship flies, uh, flies the flag of Panama. Panama is what the International Transport Workers Federation considers to be a flag of convenience or an open registry. Open registries are ship registries that allow for companies that are not necessarily based in Panama to actually register their ships there. And part of the reason that this is very inviting to a lot of companies is because there are the regulations on um, labor and on environmental stuff is quite lax in uh, the ship registry. Registries, the sort of requirements, the, the requirement thresholds for insurance, etc., are quite low. Um, and taxation is, I mean, essentially, open ship registries are a kind of a subcategory of offshore havens, if you will. And in fact, when they were first invented, the biggest uh, sort of users of the ship registries were the Standard Oil of California and the banana boats of uh, United Fruit. So it has always been embedded in a kind of a capitalist accumulation, and it has always encouraged this kind of uh, accumulation of capital without necessary accountability. Um, one of the things that is also significant about the flag of Panama is that your readers probably, your listeners probably remember that last year there was a ship that also grounded on the island of Mauritius um, and there was a spillage of fuel on these incredibly sensitive, uh, you know, environmentally sensitive areas. That ship was also flying the flag of Panama. And again, it becomes a question of who is going to be held accountable for this and who's going to um, actually uh, end up responding to, to this problem, which uh, is it going to be the owners? Is it going to be the ship's operators? Is it going to be uh, the flag of Panama, which is responsible for uh, investigating this? So if anything that can come out of this process is if more scrutiny of these open registries, that would probably be a, a, a very important and a very good thing. Professor Kalili, can you talk about the people on board the ship, the sailors, the workers, um, the working conditions on these massive ships? So um, I actually went down the Suez Canal a couple of times as part of my research in 2015 and 2016. And what is really striking is that in a ship that huge, which is essentially as big as a small town, you only have somewhere between 30 to 35 people working on, a, on the ship, which is an astonishing um, uh, uh, statistic if you think about it. Sometimes actually not even as many as that. But usually a container ship has a lot uh, more people because particularly if, if there are things like refrigerators containers, they have to make sure that the refrigerated containers continue to refrigerate, despite, for example, um, uh, issues with fuel. There are, of course, people in the engine room that are um, maintaining these massive engines. And then, of course, there are the crew and the officers who make sure that the ship is not rusted, maintain the ship. The officers, of course, um, are, are responsible for the ship's arrival um, and uh, into and departure from ports and, and, of course, steering the ship. The work aboard these ships, of course, requires enormous skill. And the particularly the bigger the ship is, of course, it requires more skill. And the, the, sh the shipping companies tend to obviously hire people that have uh, quite a, a extraordinary abilities are professionally um, astonishing. But one of the things that has happened is that over the course of um, uh, the, since the 1970s and 80s, essentially these ships, working conditions aboard the ships have, has become such that you have two layers of workers. You have the officers and then you have the crew. And the officers nowadays, especially for ships that are flagged to Europe, tend to come from Eastern Europe. They tend to be uh, cheaper. They receive uh, lower wages than, for example, a German or a British 
British officer or a French officer. So they tend to come from often from the former Yugoslavia. And the crew uh, tends to come from the global south. Um, uh, the two countries that, pr that, that provide the largest number of uh, seafaring crews to the, to the world are uh, Philippines uh, and China. And so you have uh, crew members that tend to come from the Philippines and China. And the contracts that they have tend to be quite long. So the crew members are often on the ship for 11 months before they can fly home for a month or two to see their families. And so this is also, as, as you can imagine, this is quite, you know, this if, if they are going, if they were going to be going home soon thereafter, this is going to be a source of stress for them because, of course, they're delayed by a week and potentially longer than that. And so the working conditions aboard the ships you know, it, it uh, is, is also a kind of a uh, condition of possibility of these shipping, but it has a lot of tedium, it has a lot of hard work, it has a lot of skills, but it has a lot of also anxiety associated with it. I wanted to end on a different issue, uh, Lala Khalili, and that is a piece that you uh, just wrote um, in, <clears throat> about, talking about U.S.-China relations and the London Review um, of books titled Growing Pains, The Emperor's New Road, China and the Project of the New Century. On Friday, President Biden told reporters he discussed plans with British Prime Minister Boris Johnson to counter China's massive Belt and Road Initiative. One of the things I suggest that we do is we talked about China and the competition they're engaging in, the Belt and Road Initiative, and I suggest that we should have essentially a, a similar initiative coming from the democratic states, helping those communities around the world that, in fact, need help. Professor Khalili, your response? So it's quite interesting because it seems to me that the U.S. military industrial diplomatic complex has always wanted another enemy, has, and it benefits from having another Cold War going. And so to cast China's um, provision of, for example, infrastructures in order to facilitate its trade uh, seems to be a kind of an encouragement of this. Of course, there are lots of problems also associated with China's Belt and Road Initiative. For example, in some of the places that um, in these investments are happening, there are all sorts of human rights rights um, abuses happening, including And briefly China's explain the Belt and Road Initiative, which is not explained at all in the media in the United States very much. So the Belt and Road Initiative is essentially a, uh, a plan that was put into action in the 2013 to actually gather under its title a whole lot of already existing infrastructure projects across uh, the Asian uh, Eurasian landmass, all the way to Europe, uh, for infrastructure and particularly transport projects. So high-speed rail, uh, train lines that went through different terminuses and would, for example, end up in Singapore and in Iran and in Budapest, and then across uh, the ocean. Uh, the South uh, China Sea and uh, the Indian Ocean and through the Mediterranean, um, essentially a route for ships, so investment in uh, port and maritime infrastructures. And so this was called the Maritime Belt and Maritime, uh, so the Land Belt and the Maritime Road. And so this, uh, uh, essentially, this massive pro program entailed investment financing by China uh, close, uh, actually, to how much, uh, 400 and something billion billion uh, dollars, close to actually what the World Bank had invested in that period of time on infrastructures. And part of the reason for this, of course, is that many of these countries did need infrastructures, and they're often not given it because of sanctions or because of U.S. foreign policy or because of, uh, of course, histories of European colonization of a lot of the places that are destinations for this investment. And so this is essentially the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. Of course, it facilitates Chinese capital accumulation. It's not, you know, done out of of Chinese goodness. And as I said, it does also have in areas, for example, in Baluchistan and Pakistan or in the um, various provinces in Myanmar or indeed in Xinjiang, there are issues associated with this. But it's also the way that it is being cast, the way that it's being addressed in Europe and North America is as if uh, China is sort of the next great enemy. It's really important also to point out that uh, China, despite sort of this expansion, has not, for example, established uh, 
uh, I don't know, 800 uh, military bases like the U.S. has done in lots of different places, but rather it does have one or two military bases outside of its own uh, periphery, but it also depends on private military companies. So it's quite an interesting uh, moment because uh, essentially what China is doing is uh, the enforcement of capitalism with a Chinese face, if you wish, uh, but it is seen as a threat um, to uh, the U.S. national security, perhaps because, as I said, uh, a Cold War is always good for the military business um, in the U.S. and Europe. Well, Lala Khalili, we want to thank you for being with us, author of Sinews of War and Trade, Shipping and Capitalism in the Arabian Peninsula. And we'll link to your piece in The Washington Post. Big ships <clears throat> were created to avoid relying on the Suez Canal. Ironically, a big ship is now blocking it. Professor Khalili teaches international politics at the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary University of London. When we come back, we'll speak with UCLA professor Robin D.G. Kelly about the historic Amazon unionization drive and the history of radical black organizing in America. We'll also talk about the first day of opening arguments of the Derek Chauvin trial. Stay with us.